Well, good morning. Welcome to the Conscious Marketing Theatre. My name is David Gilroy. I'm the first speaker of the day. Who's planning to sit in here for all six sessions? Anybody? We did have one lady last year, the first time this show ran, who sat where Alex is sitting at the back all day. And when I'm all day, the only time I think she left was to go for lunch. I'm assuming she went to the loo at some point as well. My preferred format is that you ask questions on the way through. If you do, you're probably going to need to shout them. I might come over and repeat the question. Do we still have the hand mic around as well? We? No, we don't have that. Okay, so I'll repeat the question back to you. I'll probably come out and just gather it. We do, I've built in some time into this, into questions. Let me just check before we start. Who is a marketer in a law firm? Okay, be brave. You know, put your hand right up. Be proud, I'm a marketer. Come on. And who's a fee earner, solicitor, partner, fee earner of some kind? A few. And the rest of you are just hangers on? So practice management, techie people in the room, Any te a few techs. Don't contradict anything I say, please, sir. That would just look very, very embarrassing. OK. So this is billed as an online marketing masterclass, but obviously we had to write that title months and months ago to get it in the program and everything else. So I've reshaped this slightly to focus on what I think are the three most important things as a law firm you should be focusing on. This is not what I'm saying are the, first, the, the most important three. It's what Google stood up at a seminar in September of 2013, right, 18 months ago, and said, these are the big three things that we, Google, are focusing on. And it's local, and it's mobile, and it's video, hence my little shenanigans with this thing just now. Who doesn't have something like this? Smartphone. Anybody? OK. Let's just get started very quickly with some numbers. Um, who's got more than one mobile phone on them today? OK. Work and personal? Is that the way it works? This is just some stats that I thought were interesting. All these slides will be available on our blog. We don't print them and give them out because we all voted Green Party. No, we didn't, actually. Um, there are, in Europe, 1.1 billion mobile phone connections, which is 132% of the population. Right? So that means in this room, if we've got about 45 people, 15 of you are carrying two mobile phones. Let's do those hands up again. Not far off, 10, 11, I think, at a quick count, right? which I, I get why that's happening. But these numbers are just enormous. Um, you know, Active social media accounts, 35% of the population. Who's active on social media? Put your hands up. OK, so we're slightly skewed. We're probably at about 50%, I guess. Who is responsible for social media in their law firm? A few people. And which firm are you with? You're with Barnes, OK. One name I know. Oh, F Barnes. Yes, OK. Didn't see the F at the beginning there. Um, let's look at some other numbers a second as well. So, I'm going to start with local. This again, um, I, I just saw Alex squinting at the back. My, my best friend's an optician, so come see me after school. This shows you how complicated local search can be. Who's got a yellow pages at home? Anybody still? What do you use it for, sir? It's not even big enough to put your monitor on top of anymore, is it? Right, I did the analysis. You know those little tiny ones that there are nowadays? I calculated how many fewer pages there were, the physical dimensions that way, and the thickness, and it's 87% smaller than it used to be. Okay? And I don't think people use that thing anymore. Anybody use Yellow Pages recently for anything? Anybody use Yell recently for anything? Who just goes straight to Google and types in pizza restaurant? And Joanne, you live where? This isn't a come on, I'm just curious. Chelmsford. 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 Okay, so when you're at home on your computer, you just type in pizza restaurant. You don't even say Chelmsford, do you? Because Google's big and scary. It knows where we all live. It knows that my laptop travels all around the country, but most of the time when I'm searching for stuff, I'm in Bristol. But occasionally when I'm staying overnight in Leamington Spa like Monday night, when I type in Indian restaurant, because I was going to one, I couldn't remember the name, I knew it when I'd see it, it only showed me Leamington Spa results. It knew my computer was in Leamington Spa because of the way it connects to the internet. It's not perfect, okay, but it's a good judge. But this shows you all the kind of things that are important in terms of where your law firm must be listed from a local perspective. Again, you're not going to get bored of putting your hands up. Hands up, whose firm mostly has work within 50 miles of their location? OK? A lot of people. Right, and that's generally what most firms are like. So this stuff is important. Right, um, apologies for wrapping at top. This is a study done by Moz, Local Search Ranking Factors, that shows you what the most important signals are for your website to tell Google we are a local business. The number one most important thing at 21% is what your website says. 
So I have a client, I won't give you the name, Bress, and they're based in Bromley. Okay? I'm bringing Bromley, Southwest London, Kentway. And I got a phone call one day about a year ago saying, David, when I type in solicitors in Orpington, we don't show up. I went, but you're in Bromley. They went, yeah, but Orpington's just up the road. So I said, can you show me a page on your website that says you have clients in Orpington? They went, well, no, because we're not in Orpington. You can see where this is going, can't you? Google doesn't know that Orpington's close to Bromley. Well, it kind of does, but if your website doesn't say we do Orpington, it isn't going to tell anybody. It's not going to show people. So that's the most important one. Another one is a thing called My Business Signals. Everybody has some kind of record called Google My Business. And if you just go, Google My Business, you can go and register your law firm. Most of you will have a Google Plus page. Google Plus, Google Maps, Google Local, Google My Business, they're kind of all the same thing nowadays. But that's a really important thing to tell Google that you're local. Let's go on to something else. Bristol is where I live. If I type in divorce solicitor, I don't need to put Bristol because I was at home when I did this, okay? It gives me a radius outside the city, okay? So the city of Bristol's this big. If I put employment solicitor in, for some reason, Google in its wisdom narrows it down to about a third of the radius, okay? So again, what this means for people in our world when we work with clients is understanding what phrases people would use to come to your website, understanding what that radius is and how we get you to show up. Obviously, I haven't shown the rest of the page results here, depending on what this radius is going to do. Right? Now, if you're going to do any of these searches, who's got some kind of Google account, Gmail or YouTube or something? A lot of, most people generally. You must log out of Google before you do these kind of tests. So if you haven't, have two browsers installed on your computer. Right? If you use Firefox mostly, Install Chrome and never log into Google on Chrome. And when you're doing your searching for testing, use Chrome. When you're doing your normal stuff, use Firefox. Okay? Otherwise, Google learns. It learns what we search for. Also, who searches for their own name in Google and clicks through to your own website? Anybody? So, yeah, I'm going to not look who puts their hand up. Who searches for their competitors and clicks on their website? Nobody? I think some people do. If you continuously search on something in Google and click on the same link, Google's going to say, when you search for Solicitor Chelmsford and click on Burkitt Long, it will move them up the rankings just for you. All right? So again, my client's phone me up saying, Burkitt Long outranked me. They're a client of mine. I'm going to sign up. Burkitt Long outranked me. And I go, do you search them? And click? Yeah, I do that because I want to see what their website looks like. OK, you're telling Google, when I search on Solicitor Chelmsford, Burkitt Long's who I want. Google moves it up. Google's clever, right? It does this stuff. Right. Um, so I don't know your name. Rich. Where is, this is Google Analytics data, and I've narrowed it down to show me the cities that generate most of the visitors to the website. Where is this law firm based? London. So, Joanna, I'm going to pick on you. Where is this law firm based? Where is this law firm based? No. Right, so what's going on here? This actually is, is Colchester, and this is a firm in Nottingham. So having said that Google knows where we are a lot of the time, it is imperfect. A lot of the time when we connect to the internet, the internet connection seems to appear in London. Okay? Doesn't always pop out in Nottingham. So whenever you look at this kind of data, out of 9,000, it says a third are coming from London. They're probably not. There's something weird going on in here. Okay? So don't suddenly think as a Nottingham firm, wow, we've got all these people in London who want to work with us. Okay, that's not right. But the more work you do around local search, the more likely you are to, to lose London. I've done this on 10 firms out of 200 that we work with, and it's the same on everybody. Okay? So there is something weird that goes on in the way the net all connects together that slightly skews this data. So I'll show you this to show you kind of, you, you shouldn't worry about this if you look at it on your own website. Right. Everybody has a map of some kind on their website. Show people how to get to you. Okay? Most of you will have a map that maybe looks something like this, not that looks like this. This is you just go to Google Maps, you put in your postcode, and you can go save map, and you can embed it on a website. This is generated by logging into your Google My Business account. And there's a specific path, which if you email me afterwards, I'll happily show you. 
that will generate a map that looks like this. This is a better signal to Google that you are a local business because your, your website has this embedded in it that clearly says this is your map associated with your firm. That's just a map with a marker. That makes sense? I mean, these are one of lots and lots of factors to do with really focusing your site on being local. And we could do a whole day on this, and we could really go into pages and analyze every component of your website. Who on their website has directions to your office? Come out of the tube, turn left, walk up the steps, take a right and a left, right? Even down to those things, that says you're more local. Who's in a multi-office practice? Who's got three or four locations? Where are they, roughly? Well, not roughly, where are they? Which firm are you with, Kate? John Hayes. Um, Newcastle, Right. OK, so pretty much all over the country. And every, every page on your website, excuse me, has a page for each office, yeah? And does, just say yes, just play along, all right? This is theater, right? OK, so every page will have, and if we, again, we could get online with facts. Yeah, I'm way ahead of time. Do you mind me doing this live? Is this OK? Sure. Um, it's about five years since I've used a PC, so this is going to go very slowly. Kate, what's your website address? Johnmhays.co.uk. Yeah, go away. This is really not a time to find out that the Wi-Fi isn't working. Hey, but it's not. OK, I... When you get 5,000 people in the whole of Excel, I can't believe that anybody's Wi-Fi network is going to be good enough. Right, I will just have to describe it. My apologies. So a lot of multi-office businesses or law firms will have a contact page for each office. OK? But on that office, down the left-hand side, they will list London, Bristol, Newcastle, whatever. How the hell is that confuses Google? Right, on the page for Newcastle, Google only wants to see Newcastle stuff. Right? Tell it everything about Newcastle. If Newcastle United get demoted, put it on the bit of that page. Oh, yeah, it's going to happen, isn't it? Right? Make that page as local as you can. Give Google really good signs that that page is local to Newcastle. Get rid of the list. Because also, if I'm a human being and I land on your Newcastle page, I don't want to know about Leeds. I want the Newcastle phone number or the Newcastle address or the Newcastle directions. Okay? So, Right, we can't get online, so let's not worry about that. So from this, your Google My Business map is what you want on your site. Um, this is a new tool that's just been released in the UK. It's called Moz Local. Kate, you need to try this. You're going to have so much messy data, I tell you. It's unbelievable. You go to Moz Local. You put in your firm's name. You put in the postcode. It will show you something like this. It will show you all the misspellings of your name, all the missed addresses, because our building in Bristol is Royal London Buildings, 42 to 46 Baldwin Street, Bristol. When you go to Google, it just says 42 Baldwin Street. It doesn't know the name of the building. Okay? So there's a disconnect there. We're talking about the micros here of good local search engine optimization. But take this client here. I'm sorry, they're not a client. I've done this because they're going to be in a room tomorrow where I'm going to show this is they've got a Shrewsbury office and another Shrewsbury office and another Shrewsbury Apparently, it's all the same offices, but with versions of the address that are slightly different. Again, this is not doing good signals to Google. And then when you click through to the next bit, green is good, red and gray is bad. Okay? These are all what are called the 13 primary citation sites that this tool Moz has decided are the best ones to reflect accurate local listings. OK? So who's got a, an Apple version of this? I mean, it isn't an Apple phone. So a lot of people have an Apple version. OK? 
And there is an Apple Maps app on this. There is a website directory called Yelp. Anybody heard of Yelp? It's kind of a review site. It's a bit like TripAdvisor, but for everything. Anybody actively use it? Yeah, a few people? OK. The data from Yelp, it is what powers the businesses behind Apple Maps. OK? So if you don't have a Yelp listing, how the hell is anybody going to find you on Apple Maps? Who's had to pay for a client to get a taxi from the address you don't, haven't used for three years to come to your current office, OK? Because the address is wrong on some website that they came across. So a tool like this with Moz Local is absolutely vital to make sure everywhere your address is referenced on any website, however rubbish, is accurate, OK? And that's a time investment to make sure that you do that and do it right. Because people will find that address. Don't get me wrong. This won't lose too many people. But this is giving Google the wrong signals in terms of it being local. And then just one last slide. This is one for you techs in the room. OK? Again, staying with that same law firm. This is how their address is coded on their web page. This is how it should be coded. This is what's called schema data. It's a way of structuring data in the optimum way to tell Google, this is a business name, this is an address, this is a postcode, this is a city. OK? Because Google would kind of work that out, but why should we make it hard for Google? Let's make it easy. So this is a way of tagging data on your web page to make it, and you can do this for people, OK? For your staff listings. You can tag their names, their phone numbers, and everything in exactly the same way. All right? So again, all these slides will be available from the blog. Download them, pinch them. Don't give us any credit. It's fine. It happens all the time. OK? Use them internally if you want. Um, if anybody wants a workshop like this in their office, if you want to play Jenga afterwards on the blocks, there are some free gifts, like power chargers and books and a bit of my time. Ladies, one of them even says, get a kiss from David. Caitlin, that's yours. OK? So, I think that's what my team told me. They're probably lying, but right. Any does that pro any questions? I've got two minutes. So I can take questions on local before I go on to um, mobile. No, fab. Okay. Right. Let's talk mobile. It was exactly 30 days ago that Google rolled out its algorithm. Now this is unheard of in Google's life. They gave us three months' notice, us the industry and you guys, saying. On April 21st, we're going to roll out a new mobile algorithm. And everybody went and nicknamed Mobile Geddon. Oh my god, we're going to fall off the earth. Everybody's still alive. You know, it's not Nepal. You know, other people have proper problems, we don't. So let's review basically what happened. Some data first. I think this is scary. Only four years ago, we have just about doubled how much time we are spending in the digital world. OK? But look at the way it's skewed now. From 22 minutes on a smartphone to an hour and 30 minutes a day using this size device. All right, so when we talk about why mobile is important, just that one stat, I think, tells us everything we need to know. This is the best I could find. It's a little bit out of date. It's from 2013. And it's not law firm specific, which I generally don't like. But this is the start point for searching increasingly nowadays. And also, people's propensity to buy, allegedly, is higher with this size device. Now, I'm not sure that relates to legal services or professional services in general. But let me explain why. You all have websites. And if I, if I, if I guess everybody who knows their Google Analytics data, you will get people looking at between three and five pages who stay on your website for about two minutes. That's about that's it. Right? We are not the BBC. You know, you can put a cat playing a piano in a video on your home page. They still ain't going to stay for 10 minutes. Right? They're not. So when we translate to this size device, really what people are doing is our data shows. Right? We run mobile sites for over 100 law firms. This is what the data shows. They want to find you. They want to get to you. And they want to look at you. Right? That's it. They don't want to read your page. Do you do divorce work in your firm? No? Crime. OK. That's a whole different story about how these things get used and who they belong to as well. So, right, but 
if I'm in the midst of you know a breakup, from my, I'm not going to be sitting there crawling your page about divorce and how easy it is or complicated or whatever. I just want to get the phone number to phone you because my sister said you were great. Okay, and when she says you want to go and see Joanne, if you're a sister, I want to see that Joanne is the happy, smiley person that I was told she was, or the young, hungry, thrusting litigator, whatever it would be. Now, increasingly that will shift. We're starting to see clients want to pay their bills through this. Right? They want to click on a, an email and go, pay me now, go to a page, type in the credit card that everybody's memorized because we use it so much. They want to fill in inquiry forms because they're in a hurry. Right? That's starting to change. So, I, I mean, it's an interesting slide, but I'm not sure it's it necessarily as revealing as it, as it could have been. But this is very key. This comes back to a combination of what we talked about with local, right? Again, on this size device, I'm connected to a cell tower. It knows that I'm at Excel. So any searching I do on here, it's going to give me stuff locally because it's the phone that it's tracking, right? Oh, and my Google habits and everything. Please find it a bit weird when you go to Google Maps and you search for something new in Google Maps and then it shows you little place markers and you go, yeah, I went there and I, and I've, I've, I know that people and whatever. That's using your browsing history. If you browse to somebody's website and then go to Google Map and it knows that this website is on that Google Map, it will show you that name, right? Google is proper scary. I know Google's mantra is do no evil. Yeah, we might have to edit that one out of the video, okay, a bit later because they might come after me. But I think this is fascinating. People are searching local on these size devices. Now, there are two ways of achieving your local website. Responsive design. If you want to check if a website is responsive, you look at it on a computer and you pick up the bottom right corner, you drag it, and it should all move around. That's responsive. If it doesn't, they may have a standalone site. The risk with doing a standalone website, which means a separate domain with separate pages, is you have to update things in two places. Okay? And that's always an overhead. So if you're doing a new website nowadays, you're going to go responsive, all right? which means it's the same content presented in a different way on this size screen. All right? It takes a bit more planning. There may be some different design compromises along the way, but that's the best thing to do. Because we all get used to, don't we, what's called infinite scroll. We're used to it on Facebook. We can just scroll and scroll and scroll till we're fed up with seeing what my sister's doing. Okay? Same on LinkedIn. So those are the two different techniques. We're not going to go into that massive amounts of detail. Yes? Does Google penalize you if you've got duplicate data? OK, so the question is, does Google penalize if you have duplicate content? Um, yes and no. If it's duplicate content across different websites, there's more risk of a penalty. But typically, what you'll have on your mobile website is a cut down version anyway. So if on your main website, your page is this long of text, you're probably only going to put that long, because I'm not reading it anyway. I did a test with a client. I did two separate tests. Uh, about five years ago, we designed a PowerPoint presentation to go in the client's office, just in their waiting area. And this client sent the slide deck, and we polished it. It was nine minutes long. Right? I said, who the hell waits for nine minutes? So on the last slide, I put a new one that said, if you've got to this slide, we've kept you waiting nine minutes. Please, uh, please phone David Gilroy on 07976. They just put this PowerPoint live. Didn't even read to the end, because they got bored of their own slide deck. And it took a year before somebody phoned me and said, excuse me, I've just seen your phone number on a presentation. Um, the client actually didn't mind me being playful. Um, so you need to be a little bit careful with those things, obviously. So now, don't panic. I'll give you these numbers. Of 100% of all the search phrases that people use to come to your website, only about 30% will be on this size device today. It could be 50%. It could be 20 right? It's not going to be 90%. Of those, three quarters are for your brand, for most law firms. They're looking for John M. Hayes. They're not looking for divorce solicitor in Newcastle. They are, but that's the vast majority is your name. Which means, broadly speaking, if you don't have a mobile website, you're probably only impacted for about 7.5% of the people who could come to your website. That said, that could be an important 7.5%. And best practice says, if you're doing your website now, you want to get a responsive or a standalone mobile. Right? So it, as a vicar would say, there endeth today's lesson. Right, I'm going to switch the video. Any questions more? Because I'll answer your question. Is that OK? Any more questions on, on mobile? Anybody not got a mobile web? No, don't put your hand up. That would just be embarrassing. Right, let's talk about video. Uh, this, we have audio off this. 
You have to be, let's make sure tomorrow we got that crank up easier. Um, you have to be a certain age to remember the buggles. Um, so let me explain what I was doing with this thing just now. Everybody's heard of YouTube? Who's, who's a kind of, I'm a bit of a YouTube loser, I have to admit, right? If I click a link that gets me to YouTube, I'm gone for half an hour. I just am, right? Because there's something else in this little strip down here that says, people who watch this, watch this, and, and they're me. They're all the things I want to watch. Um, so this is an app that I've, I've got on my phone called YouTube Capture. And what you do is, as, as I've been going around today, we're just clicking, all right, it's a complete opposite of what a professional video person will do, okay? You just go around, take little happy snaps of videos, and then at the end of the day, you press a button, and it shows you all the timeline with all the little clips. You can move them along, you can trim them, you can press the button, and it uploads it to YouTube, all right? If you do that whenever you go to an event or anything else, and you're tagging it in the audio, you mention the keywords that you want to be found for. Because when you upload this video to YouTube, it takes out the audio file, and YouTube understands the words that are in the audio track, and that is part of the optimization of a video on YouTube. Right? This is big, scary technology. I usually wear another S word, but I won't in this audience. Right? Let me give you an example of how this works. There is a website, if we had longer I would show you, called Animoto, A-N-I-Moto, M-O-T-O. -O. You can make a 30 second video for free. You take some photographs from an event like today, you go click, 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 you upload them to Animoto, you put a couple of slides at the beginning saying law firm marketing event or whatever, you pick a piece of royalty free music, you press a button and it creates a 30 second video where the photos move in and out and the music plays over the top. Awesome for just little event things. If you're running client events, a few happy snaps, pick a piece of happy music, send them a link afterwards, right? With the link to the slides and download it. Kate's gonna go and do one of those tomorrow, aren't you? I can see you, I know you are. Right? I can just see you both going, oh, well, we should do them. This is great, that's why you came. Um, so I made one of these videos, and the piece of royalty-free music, it was a proper band. The song was called Happy by, I can't remember who it is. And, um, I upload this to YouTube. As I uploaded it and it was processing the video, this error box came up that said, copyrighted music, and it had the name of the track and the name of the song, with a button saying, confirm you own the copyright or have permission to use this song. So I just went, yes, because I do, through this service. So yes, that was fine. But that's how clever YouTube is. It understands the difference between audio and video embedded in the video and says, this is the audio. In that case, it was music. Okay, but it can be your words as well. And yes, once you've uploaded the video, you want to tag it with some additional keywords and those kinds of things, but the audio is an important part of the optimization. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to make sure I'm going to say clearly that we are the UK's leading website designer for law firms because that's a keyword that people use that gets them to our website. And when we put this video on YouTube, that's going to show up as part of the keywording stuff within there. Right. Interesting stat. Right? Smartphone viewers, 1.4 times more likely to watch ads on these things than they are on a computer screen or anything else. Okay? I'm more likely to pay attention to branded ads and content on YouTube. So video, I think, is one of the more compelling mediums to get people to dwell on your website longer. But let's think about this. If I've got a website that's got 10,000 visitors a month and I can get 500 of them to watch my five minute video, the percentage increase overall and how long they spend is tiny. You probably don't even notice the growth, okay? But what you can record is how many people play videos and engage with it. Now, um, I like this about all, all kinds of marketing. It relates particularly, I think, to video. This is um, Robert Cialdini, what he calls his factors of influence. But this idea of social proof, authority, and liking, I think these three particularly work really well in video. Okay? Because when people watch you talk, they get a sense of whether they like you. All right? We watch things on television and we smile, don't we? Because they said something funny, or the person smiled and we smiled back. It's all subliminal. Okay? Social proof. All right? Who's got videos of clients saying how great you are on their website? Seriously, guys? Are you all rubbish? The clients not want to talk about you? 
criminals love talking about how great you are, I swear. They got me off this. Now, here's the challenge, right? If you've just sorted out a messy divorce, is the wife or the husband want to go, they were great, they got me the house and the kids and the dog and everything, right? Funniest divorce story ever, not mine. That was not funny at all. Um, this client of ours, Wilkin Chapman, they're in Grimsby. In their office, they've got a black Labrador. I'm a statue, not a real one. Um, in their office. And the first time I went to see them, probably about six, seven years ago, I went, oh, I had a black Labrador at the time. Um, what's the story of the black Labrador statue? I said, oh, yeah, we did this divorce 20 years ago, uh, and that was the only thing. They couldn't agree on custody, so they asked us to keep it. And it's been the narrow section. What a great story, right? But I wanted them to make a video telling that story as part of the storytelling about the firm. And they were like, oh, no, somebody might recognize it. I'm like, who cares? It's 20 years ago, kind of thing. But that kind of social proof, I think, works really well. This is something that's been used in all forms of marketing. We've, we've morphed this into something slightly different. We work on a model that we call the hierarchy of belief. Right. So, Kamal, on your website, you have some testimonials from clients, don't you? And it says, Kamal was great, Mrs. J, London. Right. Who believes Mrs. J is real? Anybody? I don't. I think we marketers made that stuff up. Now, it's marketing, it's not lying. Right. And Mrs. J probably said that, something like that to you once. This is how you get testimonials, right? When somebody says something great about you, you don't write to them saying, would you mind putting that testimonial down on a piece of paper and send it to us? Because who can be asked? You write to them saying, dear Joanne, last time we spoke, you mentioned some very kind words. I've paraphrased them below. Would you mind if I use this on my website? Many people go, yeah, that's great, right? Because we're all inherently lazy. We don't want to do that ourselves. Some people do. You get lovely cards and letters. I've seen all of those. They're fab. So, if you put an address on a website, it's more believable. If you put the name of a business owner with their title, okay, with a phone number, it is more believable. If it says, Andrew Thompson, Hunt and Coombs, they were fantastic when I worked with them. Oh, hello, Andrew, how are you? Okay, Andrew Thompson, Hunt and Coombs, everybody, just in case you thought I made that up. But if there's a video of Mrs. Wiggins or Andrew Thompson talking about how great you are, not me, I can tell you I'm great all I like, right? But if Caitlin told you how great we were, would you more likely to believe Caitlin than me? Yeah? Right? So I don't, don't stop doing the Mrs. J's, they were great, because frankly, if you've got nothing else, that's better than zip, okay? Case studies, testimonies. Anybody got business to business case studies on their website? No? Okay, so those of you who've got commercial clients, they work really well as well. But don't write the case studies the way you were taught in marketing college, right? Most cases are written like this. Problem, solution, happy. Okay? You write it as solution, happy, problem. I don't care about the problem. I just want to know, did you solve it? So show me that first. Okay? It's like when we have to set, give people prices. I've seen a conveyancing quote from one of my clients. It was six pages, and the price was the last line of the last page. Right? So we got them to move it to the top. And the feedback was, thank you for telling us right at the beginning, I didn't read the rest of it, yes, you've got the work. Because right? all the rest of it goes blah, 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 blah. I just want to know how much it's going to cost. So think about that. So I think this is where video works really, really well. Now, two examples of people who are doing it well. Caitlin, this wasn't set up before. Caitlin over there works for things. Um, in the presentation, there are, there are links to these two. So this is a client of ours, Stevenson's in the Northwest. And the contrast between these two is quite important. I've shown you the YouTube channel for Stevenson's, which is packed full of videos of clients saying how great the firm are, and also some of the fearness talking about themselves. Okay? But there are a lot of them. A lot of them have been optimized, and YouTube draws a lot of traffic to their website. And almost every time, if they wanted to, and this is the skill, when I'm talking to a client and they're saying, give me an example of somewhere where you've done this, they could send a link to a YouTube video saying, look, we're great at doing this work, we've done it hundreds of times, but don't listen to me, listen to my client John tell you about it. Right? That is a really powerful line. Don't listen to me, listen to somebody else. What Thrings have done is make some beautifully, really well shot, long storytelling videos. Right? This guy is walking through a field. He's talking about producer organizations, right? It's not. I mean, I'm not into producer organizations. I didn't know what they were until I watched this. But if you're in a producer organization and somebody sends you a link to that video, you're going to watch it because it's all about your stuff. 
right? And these are high-end, really well-shot videos. So I've just shown you these two as a contrast between the two different types. But I've seen one client in one day shoot 85 two-minute videos on this size device and then be perfectly good enough as a very quick, hi, let's talk about divorce in 90 seconds. And they just talk about it, okay? But they're getting the keywords into that audio. Those pages go on their website. On their YouTube channel, they've got 90 videos, all shot on one of these, right? Buy yourself a little Gorilla Grip, set it up, you know, do your hair if you need to, get good at, at doing it, right? Because you still want to look professional and everything else. Um, if we had a longer session, there's a, a particular Essex firm, and try not to give the name away now, where there's this one guy, and it comes up and it says, so-and-so, trainee solicitor, doing this video. And he talks even faster than I'm talking today, and he jumps in, he says, despite Part 26 of the Companies Act, 1990, and he just goes straight into it. There's no preamble, there's no nothing, right? It was just super, super quick. And that was shot kind of with a, a home video. So these are good enough. If you wanted to invest in something over and above this, you get one of these clip mics, okay? They're about 30 quid. Just search on, on Amazon for clip mic. You plug it into this bit here, and that will pick up the sound from this mic. And that's one of the things that makes a good video better. Ask the professional, yeah? If we just had the mic on the top of the camera recording me, there would be no audio. So this is plugged into the deck, which is plugged into the camera. So just something like that, a little mic, or get a, a, a mic that stands up, you know, again, 20 or 30 quid, that's just out of shot, that will still pick up your voice, right? Because if you just rely on the mic on this, it won't be perfect. But just have a go today when you're out doing your little video stuff walking around. I've just got a seven minute to go sign, and I've actually finished slightly early, I'm pretty sure. So I've got two last things to finish with and I'll happily take some questions. This is some research we've just done. I apologize for just going off the bottom. I'll fix that in a second. We've just done some research on how law firms get reviewed and critiqued and complained about out in social media land and on review websites. So who remembers a, a website called Solicitors from Hell? Remember? Pretty much all 200 of my clients were mentioned on that website. Right? Most of it completely bogus stuff. Anyway, somebody, one of my clients, I proactively took them to court, it got shut down. It's back with a different domain name. Okay? So you might want to go search for it again. But what we found is doing this research is in social media, Twitter, Facebook predominantly, if your clients are likely to be vocal, it's more likely to be negative 76% of the time. Okay? However, if people can be bothered to go to a proper review website, Google, uh, FIFO, Trustpilot, Review Center, any of those, right? And if you're going to start collecting reviews, which you should, you want to use Google and FIFO or Trustpilot. Both of those two cost money. FIFO is F W -E FO, F O. Those two cost money. Google is obviously free. The reason is when you search for a divorce solicitor in Newcastle, Okay. the star ratings will show up if you have them on your Google page. So we did that bit of research. We went and surveyed 800 law firms between three and 50 partners. 81% had a Google My Business page. Only 5% had any reviews. Frankly, that's embarrassing. Right? Go home, get reviews. Right? You collect some of this stuff anyway. Does everybody do client satisfaction of one kind or another? Does anybody use Law League as a client, client satisfaction? So you use it? You may not have seen the news. We only announced it this morning. They're coming into our business, just so you know, if you haven't heard. Okay. Uh, it's a fab tool. It does client satisfaction surveys, but will also benchmark you against other law firms. Right? You might, run, you might think running at 78% client satisfaction is great, but if everybody's 85 and 90, 78 is rubbish. Okay? Um, so, you want to have some on Google, and then you want to have some on centralized review sites like Trustpilot or FIFO. There are a myriad of review sites out there. Um, I've just heard that one of the ex-quality solicitors guys is just launching another one here today. Uh, there's one called Legally Better. There are lots and lots of these. And you've all probably heard the news that the SRA, by the end of this year, will be releasing all of your details to the wider world to bake into review websites. All right? 
So you've paid the Law Society to be on the roll, your business or your fee earners, and the SRA are just going to give it away. Interesting. But on review sites, people give you a more positive review. Now I think, even though 76% were negative in social media land, I think you guys get off pretty easy, right? Who in their right mind would complain about a lawyer unless they're absolutely sure of the ground on which they stand? Because what are you going to do, right? I've actually had a cease and desist letter in the 10 years that I've been running my business from a law firm. I'll tell you the story. We had a page on our website that listed the top 200 law firms. We still have it, but now we clearly say which ones are clients and the others are not. But at one point, we didn't have the page and it wasn't clear who were clients and who were not. And this top 200 law firm sent me a cease and desist letter because their agency got pissed off because they thought we were misrepresenting this law firm as one of our clients. The page was hidden. I mean, you couldn't find it unless I sent you the link, but somehow they got to find out about it. Anyway, it's just it's a funny story. Um, so the thing with this is you need to get reviews, okay? And the thing is, if you do get reviews or you get somebody complain on Twitter, you can't be an ostrich. You have to deal with it. You have to go back and acknowledge it that something went wrong and you're going to put it right and please phone me and do that. And do that in public, right? This is how one of my clients deals with negative reviews. They put a comment saying, the SRA tell us that you have to fill in a complaint form on our website, please do that. Which is a bit kind of, you know, it's just, you know, it's just, you get engage with these people. Because if, if it's out there, you, have to, you can't just hide, right? Try and get it offline, that's great, but you have to deal with it. Right, and then one last slide just for fun. There is a, a website called Google Trends. Just type in Google Trends, you can go to its website. You can put in keywords, and it will tell you how those keywords are trending over time, right? So the bad news is the word solicitor is trending downwards. People are, are searching on that phrase less often. I've got a theory about that, which I'll come back to. The good news is you're still better than accountants. OK? So this is lawyers, and this is accountants. The, the line's consistent. And I, let me guess what I think might be going on here. I mean, it's an obvious decline from about 2007, 8, 9 downwards, right? Is this potentially could be, as Google has got better at knowing where we are, we are searching using the word solicitors less. Right? Let's, let's go back up half an hour. People type in divorce Brighton or divorce solicitor without location or whatever. So it could, could be a combination of how people are searching. But it's interesting. You can try this with all kinds of phrases okay? and just see how this trends over time. And if I tick the forecast button, it's only going downwards, by the way. Okay? Right, I've got two minutes. Are there any questions about the stuff I've talked about this morning? Or anything else, apart from the lottery tickets for tonight? Can't do that one. Yes? Just a minor one. You mentioned royalty-free music in your videos. Is yes. that part of that animator? Or yes. That no. So that royalty-free music is part of the Animoto application. Okay? And with a paid-for account, you get a wider choice of music. Um, if, you, if you want royalty-free music, just go. So there's a difference. Royalty-free means you haven't got to pay £5,000. You might have to pay $5 or something, right? but you haven't got to pay 5000 So. 